Something that I've been doing a lot in these Unit 3 videos is telling you multiple different ways that we can symbolize certain things. And so what I'm sort of leaning on is this notion of sentences being logically equivalent. So two sentences are logically equivalent if and only if they have the same truth value for every truth value assignment. So we actually looked at logically equivalent things in a previous unit, and uh, we have lots of examples of this. So the way we can establish that things are logically equivalent is that uh, we use a truth table and we see that they just have the same truth values. Now, why this matters is because when you're actually doing a symbolization question, um, you can provide logically equivalent solutions. So if you and a friend did the same question, you might actually have different answers when you look at them, but they might convey the same meaning in the sense that they give the exact same truth-based meaning under a truth table. And so if they're logically equivalent, both answers are fine. Uh, so is it the case that when symbolizing uh, that any logically equivalent solution to the accepted answer uh, is acceptable? Uh, and I'm going to say that the answer is no. Uh, and the answer is no in a sort of funny way. In general, if you provide a logically equivalent solution to the provided solution or your friend's answer, and assuming one of them is correct, uh, yours will be correct as well. Uh, but there are sort of weird cases where they're not. And I just want to sort of restate uh, the goal of this course to explain which are the bad examples. So here's sort of like a, sim a, a silly symbolization question. And suppose the provided solution is just P and not Q. No problem. But you can see that you might come up with some crazy answer that is actually logically equivalent to the original intended solution, but I'm gonna say is somehow unacceptable. So here's an example. I just make some unacceptable logically equivalent solution by saying P and not Q, and P or P or P or P or P or P or P. Like I just keep on adding it over and over again. Now it turns out adding that over and over again doesn't impact the truth of uh, the sort of the truth values of the statement itself. They're logically equivalent. But you can see that there's something problematic with me saying that that is the correct symbolization of Joe likes fries but not salad. Like there's something odd about that. And so remember, the goal of this course is to understand logic in a way that reflects our natural language understanding, our natural thinking about things. So we will always accept logically equivalent solutions so long as they still reflect the natural language, natural nature of the, the sort of phrases that we're trying to symbolize. Okay, what we need to sort of do now is just come to grips with some other sort of basic and standard straightforward logical equivalencies. I'm not going to spend too much time on these. I have them formally written out here, but it turns out that the formal writing out nature really doesn't matter. Here's a set of uh, logical equivalencies for the, con for the uh, biconditional, the conjunction, and the disjunction. And it basically just says you can swap the sides. And there's nothing really that exciting about it. So you can know this as a, as a, as a law, but it doesn't really matter. It just means they're logical equivalent, and that makes sense. If I want fries and salad, that's the same thing as saying I want salad and fries. That's what this law is saying. The next law, the associative law, um, it basically just says if I have a string of things in a row, I can uh, change the order of what the main connective is because it doesn't matter. Uh, of course, notice that for these two laws, the conditional is absent, but that's because the conditional is special. There's an order in the conditional, an antecedent and a consequent. So, you know, switching the sides and changing the order of things really does make a difference. But in the conjunction, the disjunction, and the biconditional, it doesn't really matter when you have a string of them together. You can pick which one you want to be the main connective. They're all logically equivalent, and we'll happily accept answers of the logically equivalent form. The distribution law of conditional over and and or, again, this, this isn't terribly exciting stuff. It just says if you have a conditional and the consequent is a disjunction, then you can break it up into two conditionals over a disjunction. And the same holds for a conjunction. So these will come up in some examples, but I just hope that naturally this sort of makes sense. I wouldn't recommend staring at these and just memorizing them. It's not important in that sense. Uh, a really easy example of a logical equivalency is a double negation. Uh, we know that these are equivalent, so if you give me the double negated answer, I guess that would be okay in most cases. So uh, the next two are a little bit different in that um, they might not seem super intuitively natural to you, 
Uh, the first is uh, a, a comp contrapositive form, sometimes called transposition. Th these are like technically different names in a sense, but for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. And it just says as you view a conditional, that's equivalent to swapping the antecedent and consequent, but applying negations to both of them. Uh, we've actually used this a little bit when we were trying to understand how only worked, and we'll revisit the contrapositive regularly throughout the course. Now, the one that I will present and focus on is called exportation. And exportation is sort of natural for some and very unnatural for others. So I just want to make it clear that exportation is allowed. And that is to say, uh, well, the technical presentation is, is if you have a conjunction in the antecedent of conditional, you can break it up into a series of conditionals. So what does that really mean? It's best to understand through example. So here's an example. Being rested and alert is sufficient for passing the test. One is rested, one is alert, Z is one passes the test. Great. So I can see that I have the phrase is sufficient there. So sufficiency is, of course, a conditional. And so that means that being rested and alert is the sufficient condition. So I know that that's the antecedent in blue. Uh, and so that's very straightforward. So I know then being rested and alert, that's X and Y, is sufficient for passing the test, that's Z. So X and Y arrow Z is the answer. What exportation is telling us is that I can actually conceive of this in a different way. I don't have to think that I need to be rested and alert to pass the test. I can say, if I'm rested, then, if I'm alert, then I pass the test. <laughs> And I hope you see that this is really the exact same thing. One is just combining them nicely into a package combination, and the other is going it step by step. Well, first I'll have to, if I'm this way, then if I'm that way, then I'll achieve the aim of passing the test. <clears throat> and I hope you also see that you can arrive at that from the other direction. I could say uh, y arrow x arrow z. And this makes sense because if I reverse the exportation rule, I get y and x arrow z. And of course this makes sense because I already know that x and y is logically equivalent to y and x, and I don't have to stress out about which laws or rules I'm invoking. What I really just want to say to you here is that you want to just go with your instincts. You want to symbolize what's most natural to you. So for symbolization strategies, a lot of these are repeats of things we've looked at in the past. Identify the main connective. You want to paraphrase if needed. Breaking things up, you see me do that all the time with my arrows and coloring and so on. Evaluate the cases if you really need to try and figure out what's the antecedent, what's the consequent. You can think about cases in your head. Um, but yeah, this last one, go with your instincts. What this really means is you don't have to get the perfect match to whatever solution I may have come up with. You just need to get something that's logically equivalent. And that means you should go with your instincts the way you look at something and symbolize it the way you want because there's infinitely many logical, logically equivalent expressions of things and you just need to find the ones that capture the natural language meaning. We're going to look at some more complicated examples just to see the symbolization strategies in action. So here's one. Assuming that I'm neither in a hurry nor hungry, only if I haven't had coffee do I bump into things. And the abbreviation scheme is provided, QRST. Now, you can approach this in a variety of ways. You don't have to do it exactly the way I'm doing it, but I often like to go for main connectors first just to get a bit of structure down for my symbolization. So I see the comma, and I know that the comma is tied to some sort of connective, uh, but I also see that I have this big assuming that at the front, and the comma is there. Notice that there's no then here. The word then is, is missing, but in English, then is sort of optional. The comma can often replace the word then. So this says, assuming that I'm neither in a hurry nor hungry, comma, blah, 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 blah. And I don't care about the blah, 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 blah just yet. So assuming that, let's focus on that phrase. Uh, assuming is an introduction of some sort of um, conditional, but it's also an antecedent phrase. So I know that that has to be the antecedent and the blah, 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 blah is the consequent. I'm not going to worry about the consequent at all for now. I'm just going to zero in on the antecedent of this big thing, which is I'm neither in a hurry nor hungry. 
Fortunately, this has a phrase that we know, which is neither nor, and I know how to symbolize this uh, because I watched my last video, and that's negation Q or R. So that part is great. Now I can put back in the uh, main connective, which is the conditional, and I'm ready just to switch over and focus only on the consequent. Now, uh, when I'm focusing on the consequent, a common mistake students make is that they get distracted by the rest of the question. But don't worry about the rest of the question. You've already symbolized it. So let's just really focus on this part. Only if I haven't had coffee do I bump into things. So I see that there's this only if. That's a conditional statement. I know that only is going to cause problems. So I just need to find the then marker, the marker that is going to split my antecedent and consequent. And in this case, it happens to be the word do. Uh, or do I. So uh, that's my marker, and now I can split things up. The antecedent, or actually I don't know if it's the antecedent, the part that comes first, haven't had coffee, that's pretty straightforward, that's just going to be negation s, and the part that comes second, I bump into things, that's also really straightforward, that's t. So you can see the only thing I need to figure out here is this, this negation s arrow t, or is this t arrow negation s? That's the tricky part of the question. How am I going to figure that out? Well, I'm going to take a piece of device from my last video. I'm actually going to pretend that the word only isn't there at all. So really, this just says, if negation s, then t. And obviously, that just symbolizes as negation s, arrow t. I know that. That's very straightforward. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually just going to reintroduce the uh, only. I'm going to unexit. Uh, and naturally, that will swap the antecedent and the consequent, and I get t arrow negation s. And so I get to clean that all up, and that is my solution. Now I'm just going to double check this and ensure that I have the right main connective. Remember my original main connective that I found was the assuming that and the comma. And so yes, it turns out that that is the conditional that I put in. I do have the right main connective, and I'm in business. Don't forget, you can symbolize this using a logically equivalent way. So if you came up with this form, that's perfectly right as well. Uh, here on the bottom, the antecedent is just a different variation of neither nor. And the consequent is the contrapositive of uh, the form that I had in my top line solution. So this is a nice example of a complicated uh, statement that we have to symbolize and all the different sort of strategies that I use to make it work. So go over some of these strategies, look at a lot of the example question videos that I have where we do more difficult symbolizations, and really think that uh, you want to break things up and go with your instincts when you symbolize. Uh, so what's next? We're going to look at some more complicated things that we can do now that we really have a strong mastery of what's going on in numerical quantities, and this will actually help us go back and forth between logic and English, and English and logic.